Good morning, chapter 10, Mountain of Spices. This is the Mountain of Calamus, or Gentleness, and the subtitle is The Terror of Love. A light breeze was blowing over the mountains in the very early morning when the King and Grace and Glory came just before sunrise to the Mountain of Calamus where the spices of gentleness were cultivated. As they approached the slopes of this mountain, they heard a soft musical sound like the murmur of water on far off seas. This music became more audible the nearer they approached and definite cadences became distinguishable as though a very soft but lovely song was being played by a great multitude of sweet toned instruments performing in exquisite harmony. When they reached the slopes of the mountain, Grace and Glory stood still in delighted surprise, for stretching before her were fields of slender reeds swaying in the breeze and tossing lightly in rhythmic motion like waves or a slightly rolling sea. On this sea, there were lines of foamy white crests, for at the season of the year, the reeds were all flowering and each sheath had opened out into a frothy white cobweb around the brown stamens. It was the wind blowing through this sea of gentle, gently swaying reeds, which produced the low musical murmurings, which so delighted her ears. But as they paused on the edge of the slope, they heard also the sound of several flute-like noises. And then they saw <clears throat> that a group of the king's shepherds had gathered up there, and before descending to the valley below, they had cut several of the reeds and were forming them into shepherds' pipes. Grace and Glory had often heard the curiously soft notes of these pipes, upon which some of the shepherds played as they led their flocks through the pastures in the Valley of Humiliation. But now, for the first time, she realized that these pipes through which they blew such strangely sweet little harmonies were formed from the hollow reeds or canes of gentleness which grew up here on the mountain of Calamus. As they stood gazing out over the tranquil scene before them, some of the shepherds began to sing while others accompanied the air of the song upon their pipes. These were the words. Thy gentleness hath made me great, and I would gentle be. Tis love that plans my lot, not fate. Lord, teach this grace to me. When gales and storms thy love doth send, that I with joy may meekly bend. Thy servants must not strive nor fight, but as their master be. Tis meekness wins, not force nor might. Lord, teach this grace to me. Though others should resist my love, I may be gentle as a dove. When presently they went on their way, the king began to tell his companion about the reeds of gentleness. He said <clears throat> that the chief product from them was a lovely perfume extracted from the lower part of the canes. This perfume lingered about the person, persons who wore it all day long, very fresh and fragrant and soothing. He explained also that it was the pliability of the reeds in their perpetual motion which developed the spice from which the perfume was made. And he pointed out to her the exquisite grace and lovely unresisting meekness with which they bowed themselves before the wind. <clears throat> sometimes right to the ground, only to sweep upright again from that low position without apparent effort or strain of any kind, as soon as the wind had passed over them. A lovely gracious submissiveness characterized their every movement, and yet at the same time there was something grandly regal about the poise and perfect control of their motions. No weakness of any kind, but the most perfect command. They know how to be abased and how to be exalted, 
thought Grace and Glory with sudden understanding. And she realized that the lovely fragrance which exuded from them, and which men call gentleness, sympathy, and loving understanding, was developed by the daily practice of bending submissively to life's hard and difficult experiences without bitterness or resentful resistance and self-pity. She saw quite clearly that no force of storm or tempest would be able to harm or break the reeds because they had learned to bow themselves so easily to the least breath of wind without offering any resistance at all. It was this gentle movement of submissiveness combined with perfect balance and graceful motion which produced the cadences of music sounding all over the mountainside. For the wind turned every reed into an instrument through which to play the harmonies of heaven. In silence, grace and glory followed the king as he walked along the narrow path between the reeds. And she noticed that the poise and grace and litheness of his movements had in them the same quality as that of the reeds, the same lovely willingness to stoop and bend, and the same buoyant and royal way of rising again, uncrippled by the stooping. As she watched him, she remembered her long journey up to the high places, and how from start to finish, it had been the gracious gentleness of his manner towards her, his perfect understanding of her weakness and fears, as though he felt with her all that she suffered, which had wooed her to follow him even up to the grave in the mist-filled canyon on the mountains. Then she whispered to herself most gratefully, His gentleness has made me great, and oh, how I long to be anointed with the same gentleness toward others. She followed him for some way and then found that he had led her to an open space beside a broad lake, bounded at one end by a great cliff of granite rock. The king leaped up the towering cliff and grace and glory sprang after him on her hind's feet, as agile and light as a mountain roe. They seated themselves upon the topmost pinnacle of the rock, as upon some lofty throne, and from there looked out over the lake and the fields of swaying reeds. Everything spread out before them seemed to be swaying in the wind. There were long ripples on the waters of the lake, and long ripples on the beds of reeds, but they themselves were seated upon immovable granite rock rock as sternly unyielding as the reeds below were unresisting. This contrast became very vivid to the consciousness of grace and glory as she sat up there on the rocky throne beside the king of love. On the one hand she saw the terror and the grandeur of the rocky cliffs and on the other the grace and gentleness of the reeds which clothed the mountain slopes. The terror and beauty and the beauty of love. The word suddenly came into her mind with such force and clarity that she turned and looked at the king to see whether he had spoken them. What is it? he asked in answer to the wondering look. She turned upon him. My lord, she said, I have another question to ask you. You have brought me here to the mountain of Calamus, where the reeds of gentleness grow. And I know so much about the gentleness of your love in my own experience. But is there another side to love? Can love be terrible as well as gentle? Is love really like a consuming fire, which cannot be approached without fear and trembling? Can love even appear to be cruel and terrible? He was silent a while before answering, almost as though he were considering the question with her. Then he turned upon her a look, which was both grave and yet singularly beautiful at the same time. Yes, he said, love is a consuming fire. 
It is a burning, unquenchable passion for the blessedness and happiness, and above all, for the perfection of the beloved object. The greater the love, the less it can tolerate the presence of anything that can hurt the beloved, and the less it can tolerate in the beloved anything that is unworthy or less than the best, or injurious to the happiness of the loved one. Therefore, it is perfectly true that love, which is the most beautiful and most gentle passion in the universe, can and must be at the same time the most terrible. Terrible in what it is willing to endure itself in order to secure the blessing and happiness and perfection of the beloved. And also, apparently terrible in what it will allow the beloved to endure if suffering is the only means by which the perfection or restoration to health of the beloved can be secured. When he had said this, he began to sing another of the mountain songs. Can love be terrible, my Lord? Can gentleness be stern. Ah, yes, intense is love's desire to purify his love, tis fire, a holy fire to burn. For he must fully perfect thee till in thy likeness all may see the beauty of the Lord. Can holy love be jealous, Lord? Yes, jealous as the grave, till every hurtful idol be uptorn and rested out of thee love will be stern to save will spare thee not a single pain till thou be freed and pure again and perfect as thy lord can love seem Cruel, oh my Lord, yes, like a sword the cure, he will not spare the sin sick soul till he hath made thy sickness whole until thine heart is pure or whole. He loves thee far too well to leave thee in thyself made hell a savior is thy lord grace and glory sat by his side on the gray throne of granite rock looking down and yet further down the valley so far below she thought of the people who lived down there so far away from the kingdom of love but most especially, she thought of the miserable, terrified, old Lord Fearing, beside whose deathbed she had so recently stood, and of the many others whom she knew, who lived as though the Lord of Love did not exist. <clears throat> and her heart was overwhelmed within her, overwhelmed with the terror of love, and yet comforted by it too. Then she looked up into the face of the king, and what she saw there left her absolutely silent. But this one thought shining in her mind like a clear lamp. He made us. He knew what he was doing. It is love alone which can make all the agony and torment which bring men which men bring upon themselves and others inexplicable, explicit. 
It is love alone which can make all the agony and torment which men bring upon themselves and others inexplicable. For I see it as I see it is the means used by this inexorable will to save us and to make us so perfect that his love can be completely satisfied. Behold, the beauty and the terror of the love of God. And that is the end of chapter 10. Until next time. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you his peace.